everyone. Can you hear me? So I wanted to welcome everyone. Um, we know people are still coming in, um, but we do want to get started. Um, I'm Karen Wong. I'm the Executive Director of the Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy here at the Law School. And um, before we begin, I do want to make one acknowledgement. Uh, the UCLA School of Law, as a public and land-grant institution, acknowledges that we are present today, all of us, uh, on what is traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Um, so I think it's important to always acknowledge that when we're here in a public university. Uh, now on to our program. I'm really delighted to see so many of you here today. Um, I wanted to make a special welcome, not just to our current students and our um, faculty and dean who is here, but actually we have a number of you who are class of 2023 at UCLA. Um, you're kind of in the room, but a bunch of you are here, so I did want to welcome all of you. Um, and hope you enjoy both the talk today and the visit to the law school. Um, thank you also to Margaret Levy, who is here with us today. Thank you, Margaret who is also an alum of the law school, and it's actually through her generous um, support that the Epstein program has been able to create this public interest fellowship. And what the public interest fellowship does is bring leading public interest advocates um, from around the nation to come and spend a few days on campus. We've been doing one approximately each semester, um, speaking on current issues and providing guidance to, public, uh, to students interested in public interest careers. Um, so this is our, our latest one, our Spring 2020 fellow that um, I will, in a minute, um, ask our um, dean to introduce. I have one final housekeeping note, which is that um, there will be plenty of time for Q&A today. Um, we will be distributing note cards, and we ask you to write your questions on note cards, which we will collect towards the end of Kate's talk, and we will use note cards as a way to kind of consolidate and organize the questions. Um, to make sure as many voices as possible are heard um, and that Kate has a chance to respond. Um, and so without further ado, I do want to introduce very briefly our wonderful Dean, Jennifer Mnookin. Um, she is also an incredibly distinguished professor and scholar, um, but most importantly in this context, because she's introducing the Public Interest Fellow, I just want to say thank you to the Dean for all of your wonderful support this year on behalf of public interest students and graduates, including raising summer funding as well as um, postgraduate loan repayment assistance. Um, I think these are incredibly important things that you have demonstrated leadership on in behalf of our public interest students, so thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for your tremendous leadership of our uh, public interest law and policy program, our FC program, and um, we just had some other public interest UCLA leaders walk in, so welcome to you as well. Um, I'm going to be very brief because really we want to get on to the main event, um, but I just wanted to welcome all of you here today, um, especially I wanted to welcome the admitted students. Uh, if you join us here at UCLA, this will be the first of many, many, many lunchtime events with lunch provided, um, um, and the chance to hear from really extraordinary people. Uh, it's really, I think, one of our single strengths at the law school, and, uh, and it's great to have a number of you with us here in the room today. Uh, I also want to give my tremendous thanks to Maggie Levy. Um, her generosity has created this fellows program. Uh, we've talked through some exciting, um, fabulous uh, people at the law school who spend a, a little bit of time here and get a chance to get to know students and to share their stories in ways that go deeper than just um, a lunch talk, wonderful little lunch talk can be. And so I want to thank you for being such a friend of the law school and a friend of the public interest program. And let's give you, in fact, a round of applause. <laughs> So it's now my tremendous pleasure to get to introduce today's speaker. Uh, we are so lucky to have Kate Kendall with us as uh, this semester's Margaret Ruby Public Interest Fellowship Fellow um, with the theme of defending democracy. Um, thank you for being with us. Thank you for coming uh, to UCLA. Thank you for sharing your experience and your story. Um, it's really uh, a tremendous pleasure to, to introduce Kate. Um, she is the campaign manager for Take Back the Court. She's co-interim legal director of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And she's continuing the work that she did to advance the rights of people in the LGBT community and elsewhere as the longtime head of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, which was a really key player in the fight for marriage equality. Um, and so uh, she's you know, played a signal role in what is uh, truly one of the pieces of the civil rights movement of our day and age. And it's, it's an enormous pleasure to have you here. Um, I know that there's going to be a lot to learn today, and then there's also going to be an event tomorrow evening at the Feminist Majority Foundation at Buffalo Hills. Um, so thank you for being part of that as well. Um, and I 
think the lessons that we're going to have to share uh, with us today are obviously so central as we think about the state of national affairs, and also about the role of lawyers, the role of lawyers as change makers, as advocates, as, as momentum builders, as, um, as, as individuals who work to serve their clients' interests, but also to move policy forward in fighting ways. And so I know for our uh, current students, as well as our admitted students, that there is uh, a great deal to both appreciate and to learn from your experiences. Um, now, Kate's a graduate of the University of Utah Law School, which has its first female dean, I believe. Uh, just, mm -hmm. just, she just started a few months ago, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, here at UCLA, I happen to be the third female dean, which is also a pretty good thing. Um, and I think you're a native of Utah, right? Um, but you now make your home in San Francisco. Uh, so Kate, right. <laughs> right. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, and I moved to LA, so there you go. Um, so Kate, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, I really wish I could stay and listen and learn from you as well. Unfortunately, I'm going to the calls, but I look forward to, to the chance to get to talk to you while you're with us. And you are all in a very real treat. So let's give Kate Kendall an extremely warm up. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. I really appreciate that generous introduction. And I'm super excited to be here, not just to, I mean, I love being at the law school. It's been several years since I've been here. But I love that there are admitted students uh, that are here, too. That's really, uh, that's really wonderful. I, um, I really want to thank Margaret Levy for this opportunity. And I hope to do your name justice uh, over the course of the two and a half days that I'm going to be here. And I hope to have time with each of you individually or in student groups or with some of the other activities that are scheduled. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time on the UCLA campus. Uh, when I was at NCLR, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, there were events that were here, the Williams Institute, the Brad Sears, I've known Brad for a very long time. But when I was in college, we would come here uh, and do Christmas swing debates. We would do, we would have a debate tournament here at UCLA and a debate tournament at Cal Poly Pomona. And so I remember uh, as, a, uh, as a college student just falling in love with LA and environs and this campus. So it feels a little bit like being home. I wanted to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about my current work. Um, but what I really want to talk about is less tactics and strategy. Uh, there'll be other opportunities maybe for that. If you have questions, I'm certainly happy to answer those questions. But I want to pull back a little bit and maybe talk from a more uh, aspirational place. Um, I don't have to tell you that we are in the middle of, and this is a technical term, a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> and every day, there is a new terrible headline. Last night, the headline that I saw was the ruling, a 5-4 split, of course, from the US Supreme Court, uh, striking, uh, upholding, and this was the Trump administration uh, rule, upholding the wealth test for immigrants. And Justice Sotomayor wrote a blistering dissent where she essentially called out the truth, which was, and she didn't use this language, but it's sort of between the lines was, that the majority justices are essentially being lapdogs for the Trump administration and not engaging in any analysis and really circumventing the whole process of appellate review by granting these emergency petitions and then ruling. And so that was last night's headline. And then this morning, I saw the headline that the court has agreed to take a case out of Philadelphia uh, where the Catholic Social Services is challenging a non-discrimination law in foster care because they want to be able to deny foster placements to LGBTQ headed households. And that's just in the span of 12 hours. We could go on and on and you could open up your Twitter feed or wherever you get your news and you could find every, you could find headline after headline where entire communities in this country are being terrorized by administration policies. And it can feel, and I feel it, you know, and I've been around for a while, but I feel overwhelmed by it, and there are times when I feel paralyzed by it. So in those moments, and part of what I think is important for all of us to understand, especially from your privileged perch, I mean, not everyone in this room comes from the same kind of privilege, I get that, 
But you are in a privileged place right now. You are students at the UCLA Law School, or you will be students here. Lawyers have always been, in every civil society, the kind of last line of defense, the first line of defense and the last line of defense in protecting civil rights, liberties, individual humanity. And I do not envy you the task that you are about to inherit, because in some ways our democracy has never been more imperiled than it is in this moment. But that said, hope is the one thing we cannot lose. Losing hope seeds ground to the opposition. And it is intentional that we lose hope. It is intentional that we are distracted. It is intentional that there is headline after headline. And we don't know what to focus on. And more importantly, we don't know what to do. But it's also important to understand that even though you're the, the inheritors and you will be at the vanguard of a response to the erosion of democratic norms and protections, it's also important for you to understand you're not the first generation to face enormous odds. The day after President Trump was elected, I saw a video uh, from Sherilyn Eiffel, who is the executive director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And what she said in the video uh, was something like, and I just met Cheryl and I for the very first time last week, which was awesome, uh, down in Atlanta. And she said, talking to the supporters of the Legal Defense Fund, she said, I know this is a dark moment. I know this is a frightening moment. And for some people, a terrifying moment. But let's just remind ourselves where we've been as a people. And she's talking, of course, about black folks in this country. And she didn't just go back to slavery and Jim Crow and Reconstruction and all of that. She went to something very specific. In the 1950s, when black men were being lynched, mostly in southern cities across the South, you could not get a member of Congress to carry an anti-lynching bill. And the president at the time said he wouldn't sign such a bill. That's where we were in the 1950s. Now we know that racism is, has, is as full-throated as it's ever been. It's never gone away. We've never been post-racial. And we are still living with the legacy of lynching and of Jim Crow and of enslavement. But, but, by any measure, the place of people of color and especially African Americans is in this country is far different for this generation than it's been in past generations. There is an, an inexorable move, and we can measure it. Fast forward. Fast forward to the 80s. Late 80s, this is when I'm coming to consciousness, graduating from college, heading to law school, um, graduating from uh, 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 law school in the mid-1980s. And all of a sudden, there's, you hear this trickle and then it becomes more of a flood, and then it becomes a deluge of gay men dying in mo mostly, at that point, big cities across the country. First, hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands. And Larry Speaks, press secretary for Ronald Reagan, who was president at the time, is asked at a press conference, what's the administration's response? to all these gay men who are dying in LA, in New York, San Francisco, speaks reaction. He laughed. He laughed, mocked the idea that we should even care about the fact that gay men were dying. So what did we do? What did our community do? Out of nothing, out of literally nothing. We built an entire infrastructure to save our men and others impacted by HIV AIDS. And now it is no longer a death sentence. There are still huge disparities, totally want to acknowledge that. There are still huge problems in many countries. There are still way too many people infected. We could do better, but by any measure, 
we have totally altered the landscape and the futures of gay men with HIV in this country and others. Now you fast forward to your lifetimes. In the late 90s, the early 2000s, we see a wave of interest in uh, same-sex couples winning marriage. It starts with the case in Hawaii, and when we won that case in Hawaii, and I'm using the Queens we here, and so I wasn't involved in that particular case, but we were, were obviously we were very interested. We were in rooms with the ACLU, the, designing the strategy uh, for the Bear Lewin case out of Hawaii, and when we won at the district court, people lost their minds, and a huge pendulum backlash began in this country, with multiple states passing laws to not recognize state, other state marriages between same-sex couples, and Bill Clinton himself signing federal DOMA, making sure that the federal government would not recognize marriages between same-sex couples. That is in the early 2000s. It is now 2020, and we've won marriage nationwide. In 2004, then President George W. Bush, in his State of the Union, endorsed a constitutional amendment to ban the recognition of marriage between same-sex couples. A constitutional amendment. And it looked like, I mean, we were this close to a generation, maybe more than that, of queer people losing any kind of recognition for dignity of our lives, forget marriage, I don't care whether you get married or not, but to have the federal government stigmatize our relationships opened us up to all sorts of other discrimination, bigotry, prejudice, mistreatment. That was 2004. 2008, we know what happens here, we win marriage in California, and I was lead counsel on that case. Six months later, Prop 8 passes. The same night, the President Obama is elected to his first term. Okay, that was the most schizophrenic night I've ever had in my life. I, like on one hand, I'm screaming with joy, and on the other hand, I'm in tears. That's 2008. Seven years later, in 2015, we win marriage nationwide. In the lifetime of a first grader, we, won, we went from Prop 8 to winning marriage nationwide. Now, those are just three examples. There are tons more you could think of where it seemed bleak and very, very grim. And it was. And yet, what happened? What happened? In every one of those arcs, you had us as activists in the streets putting bodies on the line in many cases, but then joined by allies and unlikely allies who just showed up because when asked the question, well, what kind of country do you want to live in? The answer was, well, I want to live in a country where we don't lynch people and where black men and women have a future in this country. I want to live in a country where gay men don't die. I want to live in a country where relationships with people who love each other are respected and afforded the same dignity as everyone else's relationship. I don't know what the question is going to be for this moment. What kind of country do you want to live in? Well, I want to live in a democracy, which is, I think, even worse than on life support. It's almost brain dead at this point. So your challenges and how you respond to this moment will be different. There's no doubt about that than the challenges faced by previous generations. But, but what I'm trying to illustrate is the odds are no greater against you. The odds were stacked against every single one of those examples and those generations, and they found a way. Um, I love that uh, Harriet Tubman is enjoying a little bit of a renaissance in the movie. Harriet is amazing. There's also a series called Underground, which I don't know if you've seen, but I would highly, um, I would highly recommend it. And at one point, uh, she is speaking to abolitionists. I mean, she was speaking to white folks all the time, right? Who were abolitionists about how to respond to uh, enslavement, how to respond to laws that were passed by our federal government 
the Fugitive Slave Act, making, putting any barrier they could to the freedom of enslaved people. And she's giving a speech to abolitionists in Philadelphia about how they respond. And I can't imagine a more dire situation than responding to enslavement if you were an abolitionist and a white person who had tons of privilege. So she says this at one point, a passionate debate about action is important, but it should not be mistaken for action itself. Now, I engage in passionate debates about action all the time. My Twitter feed is full of me engaging in those passionate debates. But I'm very well aware that that is not a substitute for action. And I don't know what your action is gonna be. I'm not here to tell you what the action should be. For me, it's, doing, it's continuing to do my advocacy. For some of you, it will be spending weeks in Ohio during the election. For some of you, it will be working with you know, uh, democracy groups to assure voter engagement and to beat back voter suppression. But what I just want to underscore is it, it, it's too much. Many, it, it, given the enormity of what we face, it can often feel like too much. So the issue is you don't have to do everything about everything, but you have to do something about something. There's no sitting on the sidelines. Another thing that Harriet Tubman wrote at one point um, in talking about that we need soldiers in this war to beat back the enemies of freedom. And she finished her speech by saying, no one gets to sit this one out. And that, that is true. That is a truism. Sitting it out means you cede ground to those who would oppress. The first sentence of my favorite Martin Luther King quote is, power without love is reckless and abusive. Power without love is reckless and abusive. And we are living the reality of that right now. But we can, we can take it back. I, um, and it's not false optimism. I mean, I do have a reputation, for I could probably say, of being preternaturally optimistic. You know, but I'm not an idiot. I am aware of the reality and what we face. But, but the optimism comes from a lived experience. Um, as the dean pointed out, I grew up in Utah. I grew up Mormon in Utah. So good girl gone bad. And, <laughs> and I grew up in a household where I never remember seeing my father read a book or the newspaper. Uh, it was, uh, my, my mother was very loving, but you know, had maybe a year of secretarial school. My father did not go to college. I was the first to go to college in my family. Uh, it was a very, it was a pretty anti-intellectual household. I remember when I told my dad that I was gonna go to college, his response was, well, I hope you know I'm not paying for it. And then when I told him I was gonna go to law school, his response was, oh, so you're gonna be a professional student. So, not a lot of encouragement. And, and yet, um, and yet here I am. And the life I've been able to lead and the work I've been able to do, I know I've had a lot of privilege. I mean, my neighborhood wasn't red line. I went to a good school. I had race privilege. I had ge geographic privilege, even though I know Utah really sucks, but actually, <laughs> good school is a decent neighborhood. So I, I'm very well aware of the privilege I carry, but my biography would not lead to this. And I, and I pin back how it really happened that this worked for me uh, at the moment I came out to my mom. So my mom uh, was a devout Mormon. Uh, we went to church every Sunday. She was very religious, right up until her death. Religious until the end. And But I decided, when I was about 21, I was in a new relationship. My partner at that time had a little girl, who's now my 38-year-old daughter, which I can't believe to have a kid that old, because I'm only 38 myself, so I don't get that old. <laughs> But I decided I needed to come out. I needed to come out to my mom. My mom and I were very close, and this was a huge part of my life to not tell her. I, I, it was just unsustainable to me. So I decided we were going up to, to Oregon to visit my grandparents. I was actually born in Oregon, but moved to Utah when I was very small. Um, 
And I thought, okay, just before we get to my grandparents' house, that's when I'll tell her. Because then we walk into the house, and it goes badly, you know, we walk into the house and you have to act normal, and you know, I'm, I'm just gonna wait. We hadn't even hit the Idaho state line, and I just started crying, and I was like, Mom, I have something to tell you. And of course, she's in a, we're in a moving vehicle, like she's driving. <laughs> and I just couldn't, I just had to say it. And um, she, I'm obviously, she can tell I'm upset, I'm crying. I said, Mom, I have something to tell you, but I'm really scared. And I didn't think she was gonna like pull over and say, get out of the car, or, you know, you're dead to me. But I did think what she was gonna say to me is, oh honey, I'm so disappointed. And I was like, that is gonna, this is gonna kill me. That's gonna kill me. But I had to like, I've gotta be prepared for whatever she says. So, you know, I'm crying, I'm crying. She reaches over, she takes my hand, and she said, what is it, honey, what is it? So I finally blurted out, Mom, I'm gay. She squoze my hand and she said, oh, honey, the most important thing to me is that you're happy. And she never wavered from that. She was my biggest champion. And her ability to embrace me fully and love me unconditionally, despite the fact that I was living a life that her religion condemns, made the rest of my life possible. And I know so many young people do not have a parental reaction like that, and they overcome it, and they still do great and amazing things. But my mom allowed me to soar. But her biography wouldn't say that that would be her response. Her biography would say that she would be much more condemnatory. So, in that reaction that my mother had, and in that relationship, I also have to recognize, in this moment that we're in, to withhold my own judgments about where somebody might be sitting politically or what their views might be. And I will say, this is super hard for me because I am really judgy about this stuff. <laughs> but I have been proven, it's been proven to me that people can react above their biography and above the narrative that you give them. And that's the other thing we have to hold on to. We can reach people we think we can't, but we will never reach them if we don't engage in the dialogue and we don't engage in the conversation. That is what this moment really demands. I mean, yes, it demands badass advocacy and ferocity, but it also demands gentleness and humanity and kindness and a belief in possibility. It demands that too. So fast forward to, uh, let's see, what would it be? 20, 2003, <coughs> 2003. Now then, 2008, 2009. Uh, my mom has a debilitating stroke in 1993. Uh, she's young, uh, she's, younger than, she's younger than I am now. She was 58 at the time and had a debilitating stroke. She could never work again. She could never drive again. She could live independently, but it really, I mean, she went from being this lively, wiry, totally badass, but really fun, uh, active woman to 99 years old and feeble. And uh, it destroyed, uh, it destroyed me when that happened. But she I mean, begins the hard slog back, right, from the stroke. And lives and, and has a 10 years that's pretty good. Then she has another stroke. By this point, I'm living in San Francisco. My sister calls me and says, Mom had another stroke, you have to get home. We're not sure if she's gonna make it. So I get on the first plane, get back to Ogden, Utah, which is where I grew up, as quickly as I can. And my mom begins the hard slog back from a second stroke. And this is not easy. So I'm flying back and forth, she did make it. I'm flying back and forth every week, and about six weeks in, she's still in the hospital, she's still in rehab, and I show up at the hospital, and I'm, I'm sitting with her, talking to her. She's still having a hard time forming words, and all of that speech aphasia that happens when you have a stroke, that hits a certain part of the brain, and the speech therapist comes to take her for speech therapy. And so I go along, you know, speech therapist, why don't you come along? And so the speech therapist is asking my mom what we, would be normally super simple questions. How many kids do you have? Uh, where do your kids live? There are three of us, I'm the oldest. So, you know, these aren't complicated questions, but she struggles through each of them. And then the speech therapist says, uh, well, Kathy's here, my family calls me Kathy. Kathy's here from San Francisco. Um, she went to what the kids do for a living. She says, well, Kathy's here from San Francisco. Why don't you tell me what Kathy does for a living? 
and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is going to be really interesting. <laughs> and my mom, I'm, I'm going to say this more quickly than she did, because otherwise, you know, it might like take three and a half minutes. But my mom looks at me, and she looks at the speech therapist, and she said, oh, what Kathy does is very important. She takes care of all the gays and lesbians in the world. <laughs> the speech therapist looks at me and says, well, that's an awfully big job. <laughs> and so you see, just that illustration, how much of a champion my mom was for me, and how much she loved the work that I did. And no one would ever think that if you just saw her as this devout Mormon woman. The entirety of that Martin Luther King quote uh, that is my favorite goes like this. Power without love is reckless and abusive. Love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love, implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power, correcting everything that stands against love. Every person in this room possesses power. And I know it's already governed by love, so you don't need that lesson. But what you do need to understand is that your charge is to implement the demands of justice. Because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're going to be asked, this, 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 this part, this time in our history, this chapter in our country's development will be written about a lot. And in 10 or 20 years, you're going to be asked by one of your kids, one of your nieces or nephews, wow, that sounds really terrorizing. That sounds like it was really bad. What did you do? You need to think right now about what you want that answer to be. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. I'm happy to answer your questions. Moderator's prerogative, I will ask sure. the first question. Um, so uh, we kind of glossed over, Kay has this amazing bio, and um, you've actually left NCLR, or you're, doing, or you're doing other things. And so one of the things that's interesting about what she's been doing in the last couple of years is uh, being part of this thing called Take Back the Court. And so my question is that you know, increasingly for all of us, I think if you're interested in the law, if you're in law school, a lawyer, a lawyer to be, um, we're watching what's happening to the federal courts. If you care about justice, and you're watching what's happening to the federal courts, and particularly the US Supreme Court, it's, um, you know, it's hard to not be frightened, right? And so the, this, this idea has been percolating somewhat. I think some of the presenting candidates have talked about it. The idea of expanding the Supreme Court has come up as a way to counterbalance sort of the rightward tilt um, of the federal courts, SCOTUS in particular. And just wondering, from the work you've been doing, I think we take back the court or, or elsewhere, um, you know, what do you think, like, will it really check the rightward tilt? What do you think it'll do? What are the likelihoods of success? Curious what you think about that. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that specifically. I got involved with this effort to expand the court, um, gosh, about a year ago now, uh, and then did that work for about six months before um, I took this position at the Southern Poverty Law Center. But I'm still, I'm still involved with Take Back the Court and this effort. Um, because this is, this is the fundamental truth uh, as we see it at Take Back the Court. Uh, democracy is already dead, uh, given the current landscape. And the only, the only way to revive her, so it's not just to save her, the only way to revive her is to um, get rid of dark money in politics, to get rid of voter suppression and, and outlaw gerrymandering, uh, and to, um, to give statehood to Puerto Rico and DC, and to really have a thriving democracy again, and to end all the ways in which our democracy has been polluted. That will never happen with this court. It will never happen. So even if, we, even if Trump is denied a second term, we have the court we have. 
And it is very clear from those two examples I gave at the top, because there's no way we're going to win that foster care case. And there are also three other cases that have been consolidated uh, asking the question of whether Title VII protects based on sexual orientation, right, sexual orientation or gender identity. I think it's very likely we'll for sure lose the gender identity piece, and we may also lose the sexual orientation piece, because this court, the leash is off. They are being as extreme as they possibly can. And, you know, Gorsuch may be a protege of Kennedy, but he doesn't give it. He doesn't care at all about Kennedy's legacy around LGBT stuff. So, so, we, so we have put forward this notion of expanding size of the court, which I, I have to say, I'm now embarrassed to admit this. I didn't realize all you needed to expand the size of the court was a bill in Congress. Come out of Congress, signed by the president. I thought you had it was more involved than that. Like, oh, that was like this nine is fixed in stone. No, it's not. The size of the court has fluctuated many, many times since it was first created, and it fluctuated just a couple of years ago to eight, when the Mitch McConnell Senate refused to seat a new justice to replace um, Scalia. So, the idea is twofold: expand the size of the court, add uh, you know th at least three justices. Um, and and thereby dilute and and add those justices. Those justices. I mean, there's no way those justices would be added unless we got a bill out of Congress. And the only way that's going to happen is if we have a democratically controlled Congress and have a moderation on the court rather than this extremism that we have. So the truth of the matter asserted is, I'm absolutely in favor of expanding the size of the court, and I think it's essential. But even if we fall short of the ultimate goal, and Roberts, Chief Justice, is fearful that it could happen, we think that might have a moderating effect. Although I'm now more dubious about that second thing because I think they, the, the, the arrogance knows no bounds and I really do think the ideology trumps the normal course and trumps even reputation and trumps even legacy. Usually the Chief Justice cares about legacy, I don't think Roberts does at this point. So it's really about consolidation of power. So. That's what we that's that that's what we propose. Um, one thing we do get back, and so I'll just answer this super quickly, is people often respond to this because it does feel really dramatic and extreme, and and uh, revolutionary and maybe too radical. But given what we're up against, we have really no other option. And what people respond is they say, well, then once the Republicans control Congress, they'll just do the same thing again, and then it'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger in the court. But so. Actually, inaction in the face of the threat we pose because we fear reaction is not a viable strategy. And if we do all these things, we actually restore voting rights to people who've been disenfranchised. We give statehood to Puerto Rico and DC. We, you know, we um, pass a whole, that whole slew of democracy protective legislation. The reason we are in a land of voter suppression and gerrymandering is because Republicans realized about 10 years ago that they were not going to win elections anymore, that they could no longer win the popular vote. And these numbers are very clear. When you look at the states, the, the, the reason they gerrymander is they can't win popular elections. So if we get rid of all of those mechanisms that suppress true democracy, the Republicans, unless they moderate, will never be a national party again. So I think it's worth doing, and I think we're at a point where, as you're going over the cliff, you know, you really want to you really want to pump the brakes rather than go over the cliff, and we're about to go over the cliff. And I'll make my other answer shorter than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, there's a, another question that's sort of related to judges, so I, just, I don't actually know if you have thought of this, but the question is about um, the number of seats, uh, judicial seats left open in the Obama administration, which I think is maybe not quite the right framing, so do you want to address that? <laughs> no, look, it is a source of tremendous frustration that the end Every Democratic presidency, Clinton, and then Obama, we left a bunch of seats open because either we didn't push through when we controlled both houses of Congress, and I'm not, I'm not saying that Obama shouldn't have taken on health care, that in the trade-off he should have just pushed judges through in that first term when he controlled, or that couple of years when he Democrats controlled both houses, but you know what, we can walk and shoot them at the same time. We should have pushed health care and we should have pushed judges. It is, it is a truism that, I, that is baffling to me that the far right is much more passionate about courts 
than the progressives. Left is. And I'm not talking about like politicians or tassel loafer lawyers who care about it. Like average people in in the Republican Party care about the court. They, they have a literacy about how important the court is that your average progressive voter, unless they're legal trained or paid close attention, does not have. And that is mystifying to me because we have example after example of how much damage the courts do in the hands of ideological conservatives. So. I don't have an answer for it. I will just note that the observation is correct and it is really frustrating that when we have had an opportunity to fill seats, um, we didn't do it. And so we left Trump with this huge number that he has been rapidly filling with obviously a Mitch McConnell controlled Senate. Um, and if folks have other questions, please hold your card to Jamie and collect it. Um, but we have, uh, so we have a range of questions. I'm going to ask a few that are, um, so there's one that actually, um, that they're kind of more uh, kind of movement specific and then some broader ones. So we'll do the more specific one. So there's one that talks about, you know, you mentioned um, having fought on, on behalf of or worked on issues affecting both um, the LGBT community and also African American communities. Um, and the question I think uh, is around kind of looking at both movements through the eyes of the other and like what can you share in terms of your observations about what's different or what's shared uh, between these two movements? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, what's shared, and this is a little bit of the kind of queer superpower that we have, uh, is that we are literally in every community. Uh, we are in every demographic. We are in every socioeconomic class. We are every race. We are every religion. We are every geography. I mean, sometimes you don't even know we're there. That's how stealth we are. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, Thanksgiving dinner tables. You don't even know that they're present, you know, unless they're coming out. Like, and so, and then we just, we just set off this neutron bomb in our families at a Thanksgiving dinner table. Like, yeah, I actually tell you. Uh, so, because we are everywhere, um, I think it is incumbent upon the LGBTQ community, and I would say specifically white uh, queer folks to be deeply, deeply intersectional. I mean, I wish that, that's not, the, that's not exactly the best word for it, but I can't think of a better word, but I do think we, we who walk with race privilege um, have to truly understand the privilege that we possess, <coughs> and especially like a, as white queer people, I mean, look, I dress like this, and if you see me walk, you're like, that's for sure a lesbian. But a lot of people don't know. I'm surprised by the number of people who do not know that I'm a lesbian. As I'm just like, I'm like are you kidding me? It's, just, you know, it's the hair. It's the hair. Hair privilege. But, but I do think it's, it's enormously important to understand that as queer people, as white, and many, many white queer folks, not everybody for sure, but many white queer folks have passing privilege when it comes to their sexual orientation. And sometimes even their gender identity. And that passing privilege means we have a moral obligation to be at the forefront of fights for people who don't have passing privilege. For people who, uh, folks of color who walk out, the moment they walk out of their house, they face whatever petty bigotry or real prejudices society possesses, and that gets thrown in their face all day long, every single day. So I, I do think it is, it is a little bit of this, this secret power that I do think the queer community has that I have seen deployed many, many times, um, most ferociously actually by uh, queer African American women, but it's understanding how deeply <coughs> intersectional uh, queer identity is and acting in service of that and acting as protectors of those who have less agency to protect themselves. So that's one way in which I think there's commonality. I also think you know, I don't know who, I just saw somebody, oh, Charles Barkley, of all people. Charles Barkley was on Ellen. Uh, so, you know, I, and I just saw a clip of it, again, on Twitter. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not on Twitter all that often, but I feel like I've said it like three times. Um, and Charles Barkley, because she was asking, why are you an ally to gay people? And he, said, and he essentially said, well, as a black man, I know what it's like to suffer bigotry and prejudice, and I think anybody who has been in that position better but show up and fight against any other kind of bigotry approaches. Now, now Charles Barkley, as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, is no big paragon of social justice, but, you know, that, that kind of, I do feel like there's a, the folks who really think about it and spend some time uh, thinking about it, there's, 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 there's a lot of power in us coming together across, across differences when we come from a place where we, at any moment, 
have been the ones who have had a target, we are, or we're the ones who have suffered oppression in a deeply racist, misogynistic, homophobic culture, and really working to sort of dismantle all of those structures that oppress. Lots of questions. Um, so there's a, there's a few questions that actually have to do with more the LGBTQ movement and community. Um, maybe I'll read, which I think there's four. I'll read these two and you can figure out how to answer them. Um, they're, they're big and small. Um, so one is, um, what's the direction of LGBTQ activism in countries which are not democracies? Your thoughts on that, like Russia, China, et cetera, perhaps our country. Um, what was the biggest challenge for you as an LGBTQ activist and lawyer? That's two questions. Um, there's one very specific around, around any reactions you have to recent changes at BYU. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the honor code regarding same-sex couples. Um, and then finally, there's a question. Um, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong. So there's a question about, so the, I think you're actually going to talk about some of this. On Tuesday night, there's a panel looking more at the current Supreme Court term and LGBTQ reproductive justice cases, but there was a question around if this court does somehow rule in favor of Title VII, Title VII covering sexual orientation and gender identity, what basis do you think it'll be on? Um, another way to look at it is what's the strategy to convince a conservative judge? So there's a bunch here. You want to read any of these? Uh, <laughs> you know what? Let me let me let me start with the BYU one, and then I may need you to just okay. So um, yes, that BYU thing is a big deal, and but it's also important to point out that my mother is kind of an example of this. Even though Mormon theology condemns homosexuality, um, one thing that is true about Mormons, and I actually think this is. This is way overplayed, and it's not anything I would ask anybody to be. But they're nice. <laughs> they're nice. And and so I have, I've I've testified when I was with the ACLU. I testified in front of you know Senate Judiciary Committees and the Utah Legislature and House Committees, and there'd be me, and then there'd be my arch enemy was Gail Rizica, who was with the Family Forum, Eagle Forum, Eagle Forum, Eagle Forum. That was it, Eagle Forum. So she was like, she was like an odious person, but. She was so nice to me, <laughs> and, and the, and the, and the, and the uh, legislators were, were so nice, and they were so kind to things they said. They would ask questions. They hated the ACLU, and they hated me, but they were nice. <laughs> I remember when I came to California and started testifying before the California Judiciary Committee and the Senate and in the House. The Republicans were terrible. <laughs> they would just outright be like, pretty much, I hate you and everything about you. Get out. Yeah, get your ugly face out in front of I mean, it was like, it was really direct. And I remember thinking, oh, am I supposed to talk to me like that? But then you realize, oh, the Mormons just hide it better. Um, but what's also true is that the Mormon church has been shifting. Um, they've, in some ways, atoned for their past conversion therapy practices. NCLR has done a lot of work to end conversion therapy through their Born Perfect uh, campaign. And, and they've, over time, opened really have kind of opened up and and the latest some of the latest stuff from the church has been about accepting your gay or lesbian I don't know if they include a transgender but maybe a uh, child or bisexual child and and like as as doctrine as something that came out from the first presidency of the church so they definitely have gotten better this BYU thing I saw coming I was at a conference on um, sports and LGBTQ uh, athletes and it was held at BYU with about 12 Christian colleges. So, and so we had the athletic directors and some coaches from all these evangelical and Christian colleges on the campus of BYU. And I remember thinking, wow, I haven't been in a room with this many like super anti-gay religious people, you know, since I went to church when I was a kid. And so it, but it, but it was all about how to create more welcoming environments for their LGBTQ athletes on these campuses. Because they recognized, look, we want to be humane. So everybody was there to try to figure out what's a belonging way we can do this that doesn't impact our doctrine. And there were a lot of BYU athletes there. And they talked about this honor code. And I didn't realize how vicious the honor code was. If I am walking down the hall and I reach over and touch my girlfriend's hand, I can be reported because what I just did is engaging in physical contact that could lead to sex, which is not okay. So you can have the physical contact ostensibly, 
but there was an assumption that any physical contact between two people of the same sex would lead to sex. So any displays of affection could get you in trouble. They got rid of that rule. And it's awesome and terrific and hopefully, I mean, the, the, the furniture is never going to change its doctrine, but they can be more humane, and I think they're kind of leading the way among evangelical churches. Um, yeah, take this one. Uh, Yeah, I mean, look, when you think, when I was talking about examples of where this country's been before, when things have been really difficult, and you know, we found some way forward, we are still as bad as it is for uh, queer people uh, specifically, for people of color generally, and queer people of color more broadly. Uh, if you're in China or Russia, or many places on the African continent, it is a lot worse. Uh, it is, it, I mean, it is lethal for many people in many of these countries to, uh, to be openly gay. And that is not, I haven't had the feeling of being afraid of being openly gay. I mean, I was even with my girlfriend down in New Orleans. Now, New Orleans is half gay anyway, so it's not exactly the right choice. But I was in New Orleans, and I was also in Decatur, Georgia, you know, right outside of Atlanta. And we were holding hands, walking down the street. And nobody gave it a second look. Now, there's also a way in which this is, you just wait. When you get to a certain age, People don't notice you at all. So they don't notice that you're holding hands with a girl. They don't notice it because they're like, you're a certain age, they're like, that's an old person. And they just don't notice it. So there is an advantage as you get a little bit older. People just look right past you. So I think that has something to do with it, too. But I do think um, inter the international work, I mean, if we weren't dealing with so much here, I really wanted the next chapter of LGBTQ activism to be more international. In focus, but we started to get more international, and then Trump got elected. It was also okay. Let's go back because we are in trouble back here. So, um, but yeah, that ha that's going to have to be some of the forward work. And the biggest challenge that I faced as an activist or lawyer, you know, I've been asked this question a fair amount, and I guess I feel so privileged to have had the life that I've had and the work that I've had. Um, to do work that's of consequence, to have a career where you feel like you made a difference, and people actually will say to you, you made a difference. It feels like, and especially when you're working with communities that have been the subject and the object of, of hate and cruelty, I feel like any challenge that I've had is like, pshaw, you know, that's like a first world problem. And so it's, it's not to say that you know, I haven't had to pick myself up multiple times. I mean, it's really hard to do this work as a lawyer and lose cases, and you do. Uh, you know, I lost cases where, uh, and some of the hardest ones for me, um, I remember early in my career, uh, arguing a case before the Utah Supreme Court. And there is no doubt, we had the law on our side. I killed it at oral argument, I'm just saying. <laughs> and, and we lost. And our loss meant that our client never saw her daughter again because her parental rights were not recognized as a same-sex partner. This was a lesbian who sued her, by the way, saying she was not going to have any food for, for the contact with her daughter. And I remember, and that's like, that, that, the enormity of what that impact, it's, it's why you know, there's a real delicate balance between being bold and audacious and being strategic. Because if you win, yes, everybody loves you and they'll give you a free puppy, but if you lose, the entire community is affected by that loss. So we shut down parental recognition in Utah for a same-sex partner for over a decade. It's now back and we won and other cases have come along, but for a decade, it was super, super scary. So, um, so those have been the hardest, but like it wasn't as hard for me as it was for my client. So you know, you just have to have some perspective. So I actually feel overwhelmingly grateful and privileged, much more than I feel <coughs> challenged or um, or uh, like I can't, you know, I can't go on. I don't feel that way because there's there's no other option but to continue to fight.
And I know you had a third one there, which I well, actually, so there was one related to, to the Title VII case, but let me, there's actually another one that I think is sort of the same bucket, kind of LGBT mm -hmm. issues and the Supreme Court, or the court. Um, so the original question was that the court, you know, around the court's potential ruling, or upcoming ruling around the um, Title VII, is whether it covers sexual orientation and gender identity, um, the questions were, you know, what, on what basis do you think it would be if, if ruled in favor? Um, and then a more broader question on, or another way to think about it is, what's the strategy to convince a conservative justice which I think is related to another question that came in right after that says, um, it's hard to see the Supreme Court as anything but a political body at this point. Um, and so what's the queer advocacy strategy with an illegitimate or near illegitimate judiciary? Not to mince words or anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these are both so easy. Uh, so if, it, look, I think if, if we win, and man, I just want to really underscore, that is a huge if, if we win these Title VII cases, I, I think it will be, I mean, I think it'll be a continuation of Kennedy's sort of bizarre rational basis plus equal protection analysis. It's, it'll be a little bit incoherent, <laughs> but you know, if we win, I mean, I don't care. It can be, it can be, it can be Mary had a little lamp and you win. <laughs> I, I don't care what they say, but uh, because I'm so worried that, uh, that we're gonna lose. And what, and what I'm actually more worried about is, uh, is a split where if you are, gender conforming LGB person, you are protected by Title VII, but if you're trans or gender non-conforming, you won't be protected. And I think that will create a huge fissure in our community. I think there'll be a lot of people who will be like, yeah, hey, that's fine with me. And this is gonna be a real moral, moral moment for how we show up. It's a little bit the way I felt the day um, that Doma was struck down in 2013, which was huge. I mean, it was enormous to have, I mean, Edie Windsor, an amazing, iconic figure, love her, rest in peace, uh, to have Doma struck down the same day that they eviscerated voting rights. It was like when Obama won and we lost Prop 8. It, it just, it felt like, whoa, it, it was very hard to feel joy because we knew that the ramifications of the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act was gonna was going to reverberate for a very, very long time. So if they split the difference, uh, I think that will be terrible for our communities. And we're, you know, we're just going to have to think about, all right, how do we strategize? What's the approach to that? Um, but I, yeah, so it's, but I'm, I'm really nervous about where the court's headed. They don't show any sign of any kind of moderation. Uh, and the agreeing to take this Philadelphia case, I mean, this is a law of general applicability. It's not discrimination law. It's like classic, you know, Smith. Doctrine. I think they're going to undo all of it and say, we don't care if it's a law that's applied neutrally, general applicability, in service of non discrimination. If you have a religious belief that is offended by having to provide services to people who you think are odious, you don't have to provide those services. And they're going to eviscerate non discrimination laws generally. So, agreeing to take that case signals that they are going to overturn, because we won below. It signals that they are open to overturning the entire jurisprudence around non-discrimination protections. If they're going to do that, there's no way we're going to be protected by Title VII. Anybody in the court community? Okay. I have, I think, a few more questions, which take us to the end. Um, I'm going to continue one more on the courts, and then we're going to move broader. Um, this one says, what are your thoughts on term limits or judicial elections versus appointments as a way to change or check the courts? We've talked, there's been several different ideas that have been floated around. Pete Buttigieg early on floated this 555 rotation uh, of judges uh, or term limits. The problem is with either one of those, it, those would be challenged and it would be this court that would rule on the challenge. Meaning there's no way they're gonna uphold either of those approaches. Really expansion, a bill out of Congress signed by the president that, you know, I mean, they, I, could, they, I guess they could ostensibly challenge it, but on what basis? And so it's, um, I think it's the only fix that will work, even though it is more radical than any of these other options. But I think, I'm happy to have, I mean, at this point, I don't have a, like, wedded ideology around anybody who's running for the Democratic nomination must support court expansion. But if you're running for the Democratic nomination, you better have an analysis about what you're gonna do about the Supreme Court. Because I don't care how great your ideas are, they're gonna be strangled, 
strangled in the cradle sounds so bad, you know. <laughs> so let's not say that. They're going to be strangled if, uh, if you don't do something about the courts. You have to do something about the courts and you have to have a plan for that. And I will say one of the things that Take Back the Court was able to do is generate now, now well it was 11, now it's, the numbers have dwindled, um, candidates running for the nomination came out in favor of some sort of court reform. So, you know, Biden and Sanders are still absolutely not, get away from me. Um, but Warren has talked about a plan. Buttigieg has talked about a plan. They don't know what the star has. Uh, and I'm sure there's some, there, then there are people who are too unimportant to mention that I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, it, it, it's something that you, you, you can't be taken seriously as a candidate if you don't have a plan for what you're going to do about courts. Okay, so moving on to a couple of broader questions. Um, here's one, I think, from one of the newly admitted students at Young Law School. And the question is, so at one point you said you don't have to do everything, but you have to do something. Um, for admitted students and perhaps others um, who are here who aren't sure about how to find that something, um, what are your thoughts and advice on, on finding that or how did you find yours? Yeah, I love that question too. And I'm so are you all the admitted students, a bunch of you here? You're all sitting in kind of the same place? Okay, awesome. Um, so first of all, congratulations. You're gonna have a fucking awesome time. <laughs> it, I loved law school. It was, of course, it was grueling. Um, it was uh, uh, humbling, but it was, I had such a blast. And the intellectual rigor that you're gonna be able to engage in day after day, the relationships that you will form They'll be lifelong, and it'll be, it's just, I mean, your brain will get exercised in ways that it are just, I found it electrifying, and I loved it. I love law school. So if anybody hated it, I did have friends who couldn't stand it, and every time I went on about, oh, I'm having so much fun, they were like, get away from it. Um, uh, but I really, because I also felt super lucky to be there. I mean, I never thought I was going to be. I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to be a lawyer. Actually, since I was like 13 or 14, I never thought I would actually be able to do it. So I felt very grateful. Um, I would approach it with a certain, like a very, uh, like an inverse pyramid model where just let anything flow in. You know, you see a, a, somebody speaking on campus, go to it. Uh, you see an, a, a nonprofit doing some interesting work, go check them out and maybe volunteer. I would just sign up for, t well, within the parameters of all your studying. Uh, <laughs> do as much as you can and, it, and sort of take little taste from all sorts of different opportunities. Because some, at some point, you know, you're going to grab onto something and it'll be like, whoa, that is what I want to do. And um, I knew I wanted to do civil rights law, but that's not how I started my career. I went to a firm out of law school. I don't regret it at all. I think it was very good training for me, and I'm not sure I would have gotten my job as the first staff attorney for the ACLU of Utah if I hadn't come from a firm that had this kind of pedigree and reputation in the state. So there's no bad choices. The only bad choice is if you make a choice that doesn't give you joy. Or you make a choice that isn't your choice. You make a choice that's enforced by somebody else's script or narrative about what you should be doing. Joy and passion are the most important things in your career. And you may find that in different places at different points in time, but I would just be very open-hearted and open-minded about where you might find it. You may find it in a place that you hadn't even, hadn't even occurred to you. Okay, I think building off of that, um, this question says, uh, you know, in law school, students have really demanding schedules, um, and they, you know, they want to keep in mind the urgency that you've been talking about of the state of our democracy. But what recommendations do you have for balancing action on that front with other responsibilities, whether it's school, work, family, etc.? Other words, how do you make a strong push forward without burning out? Yeah, I'm actually super happy that question got asked because um, I'm not saying that you have to do something like tomorrow in addition to everything else. And that has to be 20 hours a week that you devote to it. You're right now doing what needs to be done to prepare yourself with the education and the relationships and the worldview and the experience to be able to do that thing, that next thing. So I want you to, you know, I want to be clear. You need, you need to attend to what you need to attend to now, but pay attention to when there might be opportunities. I mean, one thing that you have in law school that you'll never have again in your life 
is like four weeks off at Christmas time. And I remember, I remember the very first time I had a real job, and I was like, wait, like I get one day in December? Are you kidding me? I got so, I love that, what, six weeks or something? It's not an enormous amount of time. Uh, so just ahead of time, think about where do you want to be? You know, how do you want to spend that time? Um, but attend to, attend to your work, attend to your degree, uh, attend to your classwork, and just understand that it's all in preparation of making that outsized contribution at a point where you really have the bandwidth to do it. So I wanted to, I think students might want to, folks might want to talk to Kate directly. So we thought that uh, we could actually ask, <laughs> I'm pretty sure a grueling set of questions. Um, so I just wanted to close by saying a couple of things. Um, we have a couple of other events where um, some of the questions that got asked today can get unpacked further. There is a career talk, um, kind of more focused on, uh, Kate's mentioned a little bit about her, you know, what she did in her career, how she started, um, you know, where she ended up. Um, but there's a career talk at lunch on Wednesday. If you haven't RSVP'd already, please RSVP to, is this, we can still RSVP today through the yes. links, Jamie? Okay, but you should RSVP today because Jamie's putting in the food order. Um, and the other thing is we have some room left for office hours. So if you want to talk individually to Kate and you haven't scheduled time, um, I think you can use the same link or email Jamie. Okay, email Jamie directly and she can let you know what hours, what time we have left. Um, so it's also, I encourage you, um, if you're inspired by what she said today and you have questions, to come, come to one of those two things or one of our other activities this week. Um, and so with that, I hope you'll join me in thanking Kate and I think she can stick around and talk a little bit afterwards before we vacate.